Okay, excellent. So, um, hi, I'm Brendan. I'm a PhD student at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and I'm going to give a talk on something a bit different today, which is um, kind of looking at the statistics of paleo intensity and how to sort of perhaps we can we can move forward with um, how we're analyzing paleo intensity experiments. I think a few of you may have seen a version of this presentation, um, sort of an earlier version of this method, uh, AGU, a year ago or a couple of years ago. Um, and it's changed a fair bit since then. And um, some of the sort of contribution from that has come from the, my second author, Matty Morsfeld, who is sort of a, a statistician. Um, predominantly and so um, he's been helping me out a lot with this method. Um, so, um, so what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, Tellier experiments and I've just given two examples of sort of RI plots from Tellier experiments. So the idea is that um, we are demagnetizing the specimen by heating it to temperature and cooling it in zero field and giving it a magnetization by heating it and cooling it in a known lab field. And the ratio of those two magnetizations um, should give us uh, the ratio of the two fields. Um, and you can see that it should obey this linear relationship. Um, so I've given two examples here, one of a sort of an experiment that's done reasonably well, and one of an experiment that's uh, not done well at all. Um, and this is because probably in this case, um, there's been an alteration of the material. Um, but, um, and so if you try to estimate using this, you'll get a very biased estimate of paleo intensity. Another case where this can happen um, is where you have um, what's known as sort of a curved or a two slope RI plot. Um, I think there's a lot of literature now that looks at these and says that sort of doing this kind of an estimate where you're taking the sort of low temperature slope of a plot that looks like this can cause you a biased estimate. And this, this is a problem um, because you have uh, sort of the whole point of this plot is to be able to choose linear segments. And so if you can't do that, you're, you're in trouble. And so what we do is we use selection criteria, um, which is sort of uh, statistics about these RI plot data and other data to do with the experiment to sort of exclude results that we believe to be biased. This could be a, a result that gets excluded. Um, but this is problematic because it's sort of subjective. So I'm going to show you sort of an, three examples of plots like these. And these are all plots where this sort of curvature uh, could be an issue and could lead to sort of a, a biased paleo intensity results. Um, and whether it's appropriate to sort of select these parts of the RI plots to do analysis is not always clear. And I think different labs using different sets of criteria might exclude or might accept these uh, specimens, um, depending on sort of who you ask. So where do we put the cutoff is this sort of very subjective uh, problem. Um, and so this is something that sort of, I was very frustrated by when I, I've been doing these experiments. So I wanted to, I wanted to perhaps find something that, um, that did this in a slightly different way. So sort of the main idea behind this is that for any specimen level uh, estimate, so that's this B specimen, um, you will have something that looks like the ancient field plus some amount of bias and some amount of noise, right? And so if we knew what this was, then we could always calculate the paleo intensity, right? Just by measuring several specimens, because then you, you know, this, this would get averaged out. Um, but what we do is we use selection criteria to kind of exclude things except where this is close to zero. Right, and so then we don't really have to worry about this term. Um, but by doing that, we're kind of saying that the selection criteria are sort of a predictor of what the bias will be, right? So if you were doing this in a sort of machine learning-y type way, you just take a load of selection criteria, you'd model the bias as sort of a function of those selection criteria, and then you would, um, use that to try and sort of find this function and then you know correct back to the sort of good values of the selection criteria if that makes sense um, but the issue with that is that we generally don't have very many specimens at a site level and we have a lot of selection criteria that people use and they're sort of mostly 
um, empirically based or there's not sort of a, a really good understanding of what that relationship would be. So it's difficult to um, come up with something that wouldn't have sort of very big uncertainties associated with it. It's a bit too complicated for the number of specimens that we have. But one predictor that I wanted to look at was this sort of curvature. Um, and so the idea with this is that these are data where someone gave uh, magnetite powders of known grain sizes that sort of increase in coarseness as you go to the right. Um, and gave them a magnetization and then did this experiment on them. And you can see that this sort of curvature increases. And also if you take sort of what's, what's been done here is to take the sort of uh, estimate just using all of these um, points. So it's not, it's fitting a line to everything, but also the total TRM does this as well. You'll notice if you look at the numbers here, that um, your estimate effectively becomes um, more biased as your curvature increases, right? Um, and the curvature criterion is sort of a useful one because uh, Greg Patterson um, in his 2011 paper, um, when he came up with this, kind of said that it has sort of a reasonable correlation with the grain size in these powders. So this is kind of an interesting thing that we can maybe use to um, predict things. So the way that I'm doing this is I'm actually putting an uncertainty on it. So I use Bayesian statistics to calculate the curvature with uncertainty. I'm not going to go really deep into the statistics today, um, but you, you can talk to me about that if you want to. Um, basically, the idea is that um, we're calculating. So this is a circle fit to the data. Um, and this is the curvature criterion, which is one over the radius with direction. So if it's um, curved this way, if it's a perfectly straight line at zero, if it's sort of curved this way, it becomes a higher curvature. So the K becomes more positive. And if it's curved this way, K becomes more negative. And then to calculate sort of a slope for a circle, the idea is that I actually sort of get like something that's in between the highest slope and the lowest slope, um, which is I use a tangent to the circle at the point that the line connecting the origin and circle center intersects. And that seems like a really weird um, thing to use, but it, it's actually quite useful uh, as I'll demonstrate. And it sort of gives you a slope in between the upper and lower slopes. And the idea there was, I was looking to see if that gave you sort of a better or an unbiased estimate and it doesn't, but um, it's something that sort of averages out. So it's not, it's not using that sort of, is it this part or is it this part? So here's an example of not such a good thing where potentially there's some more stuff going wrong than curvature, but you can see that this sort of average slope is, uh, is well, an example of that, the median value of that looks like this. And um, the uh, circle fit looks like this. I should mention that the, the circle fits are done by scaling the data first to um, avoid the issue of if you have, you know, like a different uh, lab field used, um, you would get a different curvature. So uh, they're scaled so that the, it's always on the sort of zero, one, zero, one scale. And then I unscale the slope of this line. So there's sort of some weird stuff going there. But you can see that in this case, you know, you've got something that's definitely not linear and there's no overlap with linear here um, in this probability distribution of the curvature. Um, and then this is another example. So the, the thing about this one is that you can also, you know, take an interpretation where you don't take the whole line. And the useful thing that's, um, that's going on here is that because I've said, okay, this thing has thermochemical alteration because this uh, PTRM check, which is a repeat of this measurement fails. Um, what's going on here is I say, okay, so you can only take this part of the line and this part definitely isn't giving us any useful information. And so what that does is it causes sort of an uncertainty about what the curvature of the rest of this plot looks like. And so it sort of gives you a much larger uncertainty in the curvature. So it sort of helps with that idea. We normally use, you know, criteria that say, well, this line has to be a certain length, but this sort of incorporates the uncertainty by only picking a small part of this line automatically. Um, just by just by doing this. So this kind of statistics, these kind of statistics are quite useful in the, their ability to calculate uncertainties. So then, you know, at a site level, how do we how do we tie this all together? So I'm just going to show you a plot of what happens if you calculate these curvatures versus these uncertainties at a site level. You can see that um, in this case, the the red line is the expected value of the field at this site. So these are all specimens. Um, 
from uh, Hawaiian lava flow from I think it's the Hawaii 1935 flow. Um, and you can see that the things that have low curvature, um, as you'd expect, have, you know, a sort of an unbiased estimate of this. And then the things that have curvature, you know, the, that sort of average slope that we calculate is uh, off. Um, and you can see that um, probably the most appropriate model to fit in this case to sort of these data is you, could, you can sort of imagine fitting a line through this. There's obviously this sort of outlier here, um, but you can sort of imagine doing that, right? And for the most part, it would fit reasonably well the majority of these data. So then instead of having that bias term, you can say that, you know, this is sort of a linear function of the curvature. So it's some constant times the curvature plus noise, these specimen intensities. Um, and so I hope everyone, hope everyone kind of has, kind of understands this. So basically we're plotting curvature here on this axis versus intensity on this axis. And so things that have, you know, higher curvature are sort of becoming more biased and we're fitting, fitting a linear fit to that. And in that case, the intercept, basically the sort of uncertainty on this intercept here um, becomes the uncertainty on our paleo intensity at the site. Now, there's no reason why this should be linear. Um, it's completely empirical, but for whatever reason, it does seem to hold fairly well for a lot of sites that you see this kind of linear trend um, in sort of intensity versus curvature when you when you measure it sort of the way that I'm doing. So I think this is this is something very interesting. Why why do you have this? And you may say, okay, well, there's there's this here, but I'll kind of show you why why this is not a problem in a second. So and that, that's the reason why we're calculating uncertainties on these things, by the way. So. Um, this is a complicated figure. So effectively what happens is when we fit a line to these things, uh, I fit both the sort of circle fits and the line fits at the same time. And so what happens is that these probability distributions get modified. So there's a sort of a trade-off between fitting the circle and fitting the line here. Um, and so you can see that particularly for this specimen in E where we're fitting a circle here, um, the curvature gets modified to be slightly less. And to be honest with you, this specimen is probably just altering. So it's not, it's not really a, a curvature issue in this case, but this really shouldn't be deciding what our, what our sort of intensity looks like. And so it's getting modified because these things have sort of more, more power here. So instead of, you know, uh, selecting this thing out, it's just not really uh, informing anything when compared to sort of these data, which are really close to the intercept and also have smaller uncertainties. And you can see that sort of reflected here that this thing with a linear fit, fit, fit is pretty much unchanged. Um, and so basically there's, there's this sort of idea that, um, that things that sort of fit this model better will, will be affecting you know, what, what the answer looks like better when you have enough specimens. So I'm just gonna give you some examples of um, plots where we've done this at a site level and you can see that it's not really linear for a lot of things, but um, you know, uh, it is. And, and the red line in all cases is the expected field value for these historical flows. And you can see that um, actually probably one of the more interesting ones here is this site where you, we've got a pretty big uncertainty on the slope here, um, but you can see that um, these specimens here, some of which are sort of accepted, um, are biased low. And um, our method is less affected by this than just putting a cutoff sort of somewhere here, right? Depending on where you put that cutoff, um, you're going to get sort of a, an answer that might be slightly biased low, even, even just by these things. So um, it's kind of interesting that this, this sort of works in cases where even where you've got um, you know, not, not as many things that are really close. Um, but these are the sort of um, probability distributions. And I should say these lines are also, this is all done through a sort of Monte Carlo method. So these are all sampled from the probability distribution. And sort of if you take enough samples, you sort of approximate this probability distribution. And that's what these histograms are showing here. Um, and these black bars are 95% credible intervals um, on this. So they're sort of the 2.5% and 97.5% percentile of these uh, samples. Um, so that's nice. We can use this and basically without excluding these data, we can, we can get these uh, probability distributions um, that are sort of unbiased. Um, so 
to test this, I applied this to a set of specimens from sort of 30 sites where the field was known. And as an analysis as sort of a very broad thing, I just used all the temperature steps from every specimen. So I didn't, I didn't choose things based on there being, um, you know, alteration or something like that. I just did a very sort of um, naive kind of look at this. And I compared the results to secret, which is defined in the paper that, uh, Cromwell paper that uh, I've been showing the data from and uh, Greg Patterson's modified version of the PICRIT 03 selection criteria that don't include this curvature parameter. Um, and so sites, the, the idea here is that basically the number of specimens in the site is increasing from left to right. So, um, oh, and I should say that I did select out some specimens where the demagnetization wasn't completed. There is sort of a methodological reason for that, but the main reason I did that um, was uh, that I had some uh, stuff where the demagnetized the experiments hadn't been completed yet, and I didn't want to include those ones. So um, I didn't have those, but that is very few specimens that end up actually getting selected out because mostly people complete their experiments um, in these papers. Um, so sites with um, sort of small number of specimens in any case have large uncertainties and that's because there's sort of a lot of moving parts in this model. And so you need about, I would say five or six specimens to start getting sort of a reasonable um, uncertainty in your results. You can see that this one has three and it has an okay uncertainty, but it's probably you know more than people would like. This is the normalized intensity, I should say. So, so this is the expected value is the red line. And then this is sort of the ratio of the, the value to the expected value. And these are 95% confidence intervals. So, so for the selection criteria, it's just a two sigma interval. And then for our method, it's that 95% confidence interval that I was showing you before. Um, and the shaded area is uh, plus or minus three microtesla in all cases. So you get an idea sort of the absolute deviation as well. And you can see that sort of in most cases, we get a very similar result to the secret uh, criteria. Um, and you can see that um, as you sort of increase your number of specimens, actually um, my method starts to become more precise than the secret method. I think that that's, um, that's something to know. And basically the reason for that is that it's like looking at a, a standard error of the mean, and these are just sample standard deviations. Um, and you can see that for the PICRIT stuff, they don't generally perform as well. They're generally you know, more affected by these biased results. So um, I have another set from the other 15. Um, so in this case, you can see that when we get to sort of the high numbers of specimens, you'll notice that this high precision thing starts to get sort of more precise um, in some cases than we would expect. So it, the picture is not, you know, great everywhere. Um, and the reason I think for this is, as I said before, this is like a standard error in the mean. And so that would also be um, inaccurate. For these sites, um, these three um, in particular, um, these are Yuji Yamamoto papers where he suggests that there's perhaps a TCRM acquisition, which causes a slight bias in the Tellier experiments. And he says, that's why you should use his LTD Shaw method. Um, the other thing that he mentions in, in this paper in particular is actually that there's, there's an uncertainty in the IGRF field um, for some of these sites, right? Which is about two microtesla. And actually if you include that, that they do, you know, sort of within confidence overlap with our data. So, so there's sort of either of those could be invoked here. And you can see that there are sort of some sites like this MSH site where um, we have sort of a lot of poor quality data and it does sort of make an inaccurate result in the end because there's basically nothing good in there. And what's going on wrong with this site is probably not curvature. Um, but there's sort of a, a, these are imprecise with high numbers of specimens. So there's actually a way of sort of telling that there's something wrong with these sites, which I'm gonna go into now. So basically the way that this looks, this is a plot of the sort of number of specimens per site. And then this is the sort of width of that 95% credible interval as an estimate uh, of the paleo intensity. And you can see that um, basically this is, this is a log scale. So these are like, this is like a hundred microtesla and this dash line is 20 microtesla. This is five specimens, right? And so you can kind of see that as things increase in their number of specimens, 
they generally sort of get down to sort of that full 95% confidence interval being uh, less than uh, 10 microtesla, which is, you know, if you, if this was a normal distribution, that would be a standard deviation of 2.5 microtesla, right, for the sort of full width, the 95% confidence interval. And these, the, the coloration here, I should say, is um, basically the, the deviation from the expected value. And so you can see that sort of these things that despite having high numbers of specimens have a high deviation from the expected value, um, also have high uncertainties with these high numbers of specimens, it's sort of greater than 20 with more than five, which is sort of something that I'm looking at. Some, it's somewhere around here, right? And so this is kind of telling you that there's something going wrong, which is that you keep measuring more things, but you're not really converging on a very precise estimate. Um, so sort of the idea with the workflow with this would be that, you know, you'd start off here as you're measuring specimens. And as you continue to measure more things, you get more precise until you, you know, reach a sort of desired level of precision. Um, and if you don't reach that desired level of precision after a certain number of specimens, then you say, well, there's something wrong with this site. Um, this, this methodology isn't, isn't sort of what we need to do for this. Um, so sort of, I guess the, the advantages of this is obviously you have this workflow uh, where you, could, you don't need to worry about sort of the numbers. And the, the other thing is that it sort of, it propagates these uncertainties um, from the sort of um, interpretations that you make that are subjective into, um, into your sort of site level estimate. And so this means that it basically accounts for sort of all those selection criteria that are things that are like, curvature, well, obviously the curvature one, but also sort of length of line and sort of scatter things. Um, it sort of incorporates that into the, the uncertainty of what the curvature and therefore what the bias is. This method can't tell you which set of temperature steps to use. So sort of my, my suggestion there is that um, you shouldn't pick your set of temperature steps based on the sort of RI plot um, in field zero field steps. You can do it based on things like PTRM checks, which are indicators of alteration. And you can probably do it based on um, direction um, for this method, because you know if you have multiple components, then you should be able to select things based on direction. Um, but uh, you probably shouldn't do it just based on what's curved or not, because then you may be getting sort of, you know, your uncertainty will blow up, but you might start to get things that are, that are biased in there. Um, so sort of the final part of this project is that I'm sort of working on a web-based dashboard that takes data sort of formatted in the, the magic format and you can process it using this method. And so the aim is to make this uh, available sort of as the paper releases. Um, and then you can sort of just analyze your data using this. Um, at this, you know, and so hopefully this, this will be going live, you know, you, I don't know exactly when, but I, I want to be submitting this sort of within the next month sometime. So are there, are there any questions? Um, imagine there will be. Yeah. I have a Thank question. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Brendan. Uh, really nice talk. And um, the, yeah, in principle, this, this sounds great. Um, I've got lots of questions about the details of it, but I'll try and restrict it to, to two. So you mentioned overprints right at the end there, uh, yeah. or multiple components, because mm -hmm. I guess you've only tested this on, on zero age rocks, right? Which don't Right, yeah. Any... So well, not zero. Yeah, I've tested this on historical things. Yeah, there's, 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 there's a question of overprints. Um, I just received um, some data that are... Um, that are archaeomagnetic data that were recorded in two different fields. So I think they're bricks that were fired and then used in a furnace somewhere else. And so they, they record two different fields. And so I'm going to try this on those. But in theory, because you can sort of make that selection and you can make it based on direction, right? You, you will still find um, an answer to that. It's just that because you've got a lower part of the line, your uncertainty blows up from that. Okay. So you, you sort of, with this method, the idea is that you want to make the best interpretation of the data that you can, given the evidence you have. But I would argue that you probably don't want to do that on RI plot data alone, unless they're PTRM checks. You want some sort of other evidence that there's alteration or that there's another, another field. Now, 
people might say that um, with VRM, um, there is an issue because, you know, VRM could be in a similar direction. And I guess I would argue there that you could probably select out the temperature steps according to sort of the nail theory of VRM if you have an idea about how old these things are. Um, but you don't want to select things out um, that have sort of a greater number of temperature steps than that, because then what is that, right? If it's not, if it's not a nail theory VRM, then you're getting into the realm of things that you don't really understand. And then, then there are some issues with that. Sure. Okay. But in principle, you, you, you'd you expect this to be useful for much older rocks as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah and okay. I've tested it. I have tested it on some of my results from Hawaii, which range between sort of zero and five, which are not, you know, that old, but they definitely have overprints in some cases for the, well, not overprints, but VRMs that are in a different direction. Um, and um, those uh, actually work um, really well. So, yeah. Oops. Right. Uh, Set. Oh, can, I, can I ask a follow-up thing? Sorry, because you mentioned yeah. PTRM checks there as well, mm -hmm. uh, the alteration. So you're excluding parts which you're saying are clearly biased due to alteration? Um, oh. Not in the data that I've presented. I just did a really naive uh, fit to okay. just the whole thing, and it still works. Right? Okay, well, that's, 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 that's very boring for me because because yeah. um, PTRM checks can fail because of MD behavior, right? Which is what you're trying to... Uh, right, yes. To come that's anyway. an issue. Something that it's possible to look at, and I don't necessarily advocate for PTRM checks. I mean, you could, you could look at, you know, something like uh, bulk susceptibility um, after each measurement and stuff like that, and that might be... Uh, a more a more useful indicator. I, I, I'm not. I'm kind of open to the idea of using other things as an indicator for alteration. But I just think you need that evidence of something being alteration. Um, and PTRM checks are probably more likely to be that than multi-domain effects. Okay, I, I've got a couple more questions. Um, Who is that? Sorry, Adrian and, and Win. Um, like, I, 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 hi. It's, that's a really nice talk, Brendan. I. Firstly, I wouldn't get too hung up on the Mount St. Helens samples. I know Greg will tell you that, you know, he, the success rate on those was pretty close to zero. So, I, you yeah. know, there, there was a lot of uh, chemical alteration in those samples. Right. I was just kind of curious because I know that Andy and, and both Greg have worked on, you know, how many samples as a rule of thumb should you be aiming to sample in the field? It's okay, you know, coming back and saying you need to keep measuring samples until, until you get to this optimum number. Or, or behavior but when you're in the field you don't know what you're going to get so i mean how many what would your sam what would you suggest your sampling st strategy in the field should be for people how many samples should they be collecting per right. unit right so so because um yeah so so i guess for me this is not this is not something that i've been thinking about in that way because at scripts what we do is we take hand samples and then we use these small chips Okay. to do um, pale intensity measurements. So, so number of samples is not really a, a field constraint that we have to think about. Um, I mean, I think as a general rule, you want to drill as many cores as you can, right? Um, if you've got a good, but if you've got a good sort of uh, set of measurements, right, it seems to be that, you know, within about, I don't know, less, less than 10, right? Yeah. Um, you seem to be able to get a sort of a reasonable uncertainty on this. And Although this number is 20, right? That's the full width of the 95% confidence interval. So that's that's not actually a, as large a number as you would think when you compare it to sort of what we, we normally look about with pale intensity results, which is where we, we often will say sort of a standard deviation of five microtesla is, is what's acceptable. So, you know, maybe, maybe drill sort of, you know, uh, 10, 10 would be great, right? <laughs> if you can yeah. get uh, six or seven might be more realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, when? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I mean, obviously, this depends upon the linearity between your um, curvature. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered, uh, you know, have you, you know, you showed that one graph, I guess, that looked vaguely linear, but uh, to, to have much confidence in this, it would be nice to have some sort of uh, understanding of, about why that should be, or if it varies according to if mineralogy or distribution. Yeah, I, I, I have no idea why um, why that's the case. So I didn't I didn't show the data here, but those crosser data as well, they also obey this kind of, they're mm -hmm. actually really highly linear, except for the single domain one. But um, 
it doesn't it's it's not that far off the line so it doesn't it doesn't bias the result that much so i called that site synthetic 60 because it doesn't have a name and you can see that it's it's moved slightly high but um it still gives you sort of a reasonable result um uh but those the all the all the um sort of non perfect sd things lie on like an almost perfect line when you use this method on them so i do think that there's potentially whatever this effect is there is potentially some sort of relationship there which i you know it's interesting unless unless that's just a fluke um but i it does seem to keep coming up in in sites where you know you wouldn't expect it to where i you know you, you see things that have you know very linear looking um, results, which is which is always interesting to me. Yeah. I, I have no idea why I did I did try um, because I was like, okay, well, you know, th there's no reason that it should be a linear model. I did try doing this with um, higher order polynomial fits, and um, just to see, you know, if something if something like that would work, or if there's different models that that would be appropriate. And um, they're all worse, basically, because the number of parameters increases and the, um, the sort of amount. But, it, but it's not of... a multi domain effect, right? Because you'd see it in the Peter M checks to a certain degree. What do you mean? The curvature is not a multi domain yeah. effect. Well, the linearity. Um, well, OK, so that's the linearity of the curvature with the specimen level intensity yeah um i think comes from the fact that i'm using that tangent to fit things um i don't think you would see that as easily if you were just using um like you know a best fitting line to part of the data or something like that so right. i think that's why this this hasn't been observed so it's it's something to do with like the aspect ratio of that i i don't i, don't, I honestly can't mm. couldn't comment on why it's the case um but um, I think it's I think it's interesting that it it's something that I've observed, um, yeah. but yeah, I did I did try higher order polynomial fits and the the precision blows up and the accuracy doesn't get any better. So mm -hmm. I thought that the linear fit is the most appropriate thing to to apply here. Yeah. Okay, looks good. So we've got another question from Greg. Hi, 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 Brendan. Um, that's a really good talk. Um, uh, there's a ton of stuff to to for me to think about and to di digest there. But actually, this the main thing I'm, I'll, I'll I'll sort of make a comment on is um, kind of follows on from what you were just talking about. Um, you know, at first glance, you might think that this method might depend a little bit on um, your choice of how you define your tangent. Um, when you're um, uh, fitting your curves, mm -hmm. but um, I, I, I suspect that it probably doesn't. Um, and this mm -hmm. kind of comes back to some of the data that, that we saw when we looked at the synthetic samples in the original curvature paper. And I think the reason why you see such a nice linear relationship between curvature and, and intensity. So, you know, if you pick, you can actually pick a, a best fit line on almost any segment of, um, of the curved derived plot. And you'll find that there is a, a, a general um, linear relationship with that intensity estimate and um, the degree of curvature. And, and that's just, it's a, a, a geometric factor with yeah. how um, a circle is fitted. The, the, the curvature of a circle basically is related yeah. to its, its slope. Um, but I'd be interested to see if you were to define your tangent differently, mm -hmm. um, that, that make sure that you do get a consistent linear behavior um, mm -hmm. when you're comparing intensity to, um, uh, to the curvature. And all, all it should really do, I suspect, is change the uh, slope of that linear relationship. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and that, that would be a quite a useful thing to check that it's robust, that it's independent of how you define um, mm -hmm. Uh, your tangent fit. Uh, yeah. And then there's a ton of other questions and ideas and things, but I don't mm -hmm. think we'll have time to, to, to yeah, feel uh, free discuss to them. Yeah, if you want to talk about it yeah. sometime as well. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, 